I've been very excited to talk about the War Machines. This is, to me, a very pivotal VHS release. This is one that I am really excited for because there are so many great things that came about with this release. And I'm very excited to share my memories of them and also hear your memories of them as well. You know, as I always say, because there's a lot that happened with this release, I'm going to be talking about a lot of things today. If I get anything wrong, Feel free to correct me. Feel free to, uh, you know, send me a, a very uh, polite note if you wouldn't mind, and let me know. You know, because uh, this is something that we're constantly trying to learn together and try to figure out together uh, in terms of that this woven history of Doctor Who on BBC Video, and I'm very excited about that. Something else I want to draw to your attention to: um, I decided to try the Patreon route. And if uh, and at the time of recording this, I don't have it all laid out, but by the time this video is released, it all will be there. So please go to the Patreon link, consider supporting me. It all it just it, it will kick me in the butt to put more stuff out. Not only this video and other Doctor Who videos, but also the podcast. Remember that, as well as uh, as well as my DVD Blu-ray. Uh, reviews that I put on video like I've been promising or threatening however you want to look at it doing a uh, <laughs> quater mass in the pit on blu-ray you know or 1984 that just came out from BFI these are things I definitely want to uh, put together it's a kick in my butt it's also this stuff is time consuming as you can imagine all of you content creators you know what I'm talking about even though it doesn't look like it is but you know like in front of me there's like five lights you know all these things just to kind of keep things going and whatnot that's why I ask if you consider uh, supporting what I do at uh, there's multiple levels. Each one have a little bit more rewards if you want to do so. I would greatly appreciate it. Otherwise, enjoy the video regardless because I do want you to enjoy these. But uh, with the Patreon, there'll be some behind the scenes stuff, some extra stuff I'm going to be posting, scans of covers, whatnot. So uh, definitely uh, check it out, please. I would greatly appreciate it. 1997 was a great starting point for me for uh, getting revitalized in uh, in uh, Doctor Who on BBC Video, on VHS. And I, I believe for myself, 1997 through 1999 is kind of the sweet spot for me of releases because that is when uh, the regular uh, work done by the restoration team working on these VHSs was becoming more normal. You know, up until that point, we did have some great releases um, in terms of like the Five Doctors Special Edition or uh, the Pertwees, the colorized Pertwees or the Years Tapes. I mean, these were all great, great things, but it felt like the mantle had been, uh, had been moved over to the restoration team on these, on how Doctor Who's presented on home media, on video, and uh, it was really exciting. Uh, I remember that um, I knew Steve Cole, who was in charge of the brand of Doctor Who around that time, and, and I think he just, he catapulted it, not just with, uh, with uh, the VHS releases, but with the the books, getting the you know the past Doctor adventures in the audio, everything, getting all of that going. Um, and I haven't talked to Steve in a long time. I can't imagine he'd remember who I am, and I I totally understand. We used to actually all of us hang out at the Gallifrey convention a lot, and it was really fun. To and I don't think he ever really gave away any specific information that inside information or anything but it was fun him just talking about it because he was in charge of doctor who and that was really cool i was so happy for him he left at some point to pursue other things and i thought to myself why would anyone want to leave that well you know not everyone just wants to work on doctor who for life greg other people have I, quote ambition but i was i was certainly very much one of those people that was like really excited to hear how he was moving the brand forward and the war machines was a great 
uh, starting point for that. We'll be talking about that all in a little bit. It was also the the kind of I I mean I know that this release was in 1997. 1996 there was a rebranding and we'll talk about that but i really think that that rebranding kind of settled into itself in the 1997 releases and we'll talk about that too but boy this was this was truly uh a great time as far as i'm concerned and i'm going to share that information with you you know the story itself to me immediately stuck out when i first saw it because it it was con you know at that point i'd seen a lot of other doctor who you know hartnell stuff was you know kind of in the middle of seeing all the other stuff because that's how it worked on pbs you just got it when the stations got it in but the thing is is that it was uh immediately like after watching all the hartnell stuff and i'm going to be honest watching it movie version as far as i'm concerned well, all the episodes together, that's tough. It's really tough for me to watch them all together. But watching them episodically changes it all for me for some reason. Where I'm going with that, though, is that watching the movie version, watching from Unearthly Child till here, it didn't impress me all that much at the time. Doctor Who was not very uh, interesting to me at that point. And uh, in terms of the Hartnell stuff, I expected so much more. But the thing was, is that it was um, a breath of fresh air with the War Machines because we really got out of studio. There's a lot of luscious uh, location filming. And it was really the first time that Doctor Who had been doing a lot of location filming in contemporary London for its time, modern day London. And being a big fan of London and not knowing anything about it, to be honest, at the time, it was very fascinating. Stuff like the post office tower. I mean, the way that it looked, I could, I just imagined that when you'd see it on, you know, when you go to London, that thing would be dwarfing everything. It just massive. And of course it doesn't, but it's beautiful. It's a beautiful piece of architecture. And all this stuff was really fascinating uh, for me. And to see William Hartnell's doctor, interplay with with like Sir Charles and the people uh you know the Professor Brett and all these other people who were taken over by Wotan but how he was immediately accepted into the group but yet he still was in a sense an anti-authoritative figure but he was able to play it was like he played both sides really well to be able to express to um ben that you know <laughs> you you know you just tread carefully but you are on the right track but also make sure that sir charles got what he wanted it was really such a great story and and 1960s robots of any kind is really interesting to me so uh just fantastic and plus polly you know, Polly, I mean, Ben to a certain extent, but Polly is just a modern character. You know, she really looks like part of that 1960s look, the mid-60s, the swinging 60s. She looks fantastic. Everyone else who had been in the, you know, companion role had a very different look. Like, like you know, because it was early 60s, kind of an early 60s look, but you kind of get a bit glamorous with Polly. And it's just, everything about it is is just on a different level. And I, you know, I just loved watching it. So good. So I first saw The War Machines in 1986. And so at that point, like I said, it was all movie version. In 1986, I had been two years into my Doctor Who journey as far as uh, having seen episodes. I started in August of 1984 with The Visitation. And I just never had seen a whole lot of it or been really involved in any kind of Doctor Who fandom. So uh, one thing I didn't know anything about was missing episodes. And as it being movie versions, you get these clump of episodes in a pledge break. And for those of you who don't know, a pledge drive on PBS is basically people from the TV station you're watching on air asking us, the viewers, for money to keep the stations going. That's just how PBS works, public broadcasting. When you put in, when you become a member, you end up 
um, getting like like some bit of Doctor Who something if you got it through Doctor Who or whatever. But during one of the pledge breaks, because they'll just talk about some stuff that maybe we don't know or whatever, they mentioned that uh, a lot of Doctor Who stories or episodes they called were missing. And I'm like, wow, I had no idea. And they said that uh, there was like a hundred and at that point, 120 something they might have mentioned. I don't know how that equates to what really was. To me, I didn't know that these blocks of episodes that created one story, I didn't realize that there were episodes. I just thought each hour and a half to two and a half hour thing was an episode. So I'm like, how many of these things did they make? If they're, if, you know, I'm watching tons of these and there's like 120 some hour and a half stories missing, holy cow. So I just was really confused. But then we get to the Hartnells and, you know, I have the program guide from Jean-Marc Lefissier, volume one. That's where I knew what stories were around. That's the first time I ever knew anything about what uh, episodes titles were, where they where they fell in, in broadcast history. I mean, this is like my first list. And so I had this and I knew what was coming up because you would go through it and you'd read the synopsis. Yeah, I'd, I'd read the whole thing. I mean, I'll probably forget by the time it actually ran anyway. So like I knew when the first time we saw the Cybermen or, or you know, evil what Evil the Daleks was and stuff like that. And these all sounded amazing. And I wanted to see these really badly. And I may have had some DWMs. They didn't talk about missing episodes, but they talked about some of these stories. So I may have pictures. So I'm like, ooh, I want to see these. I want to see all this stuff especially like the DWBs that had pictures of of on location from the invasion. You know, all these tantalizing looks at episodes I haven't seen. But now that we're running the Hartnell and Troughton packages of stories, I'm going to see these. So we start out with An Unearthly Child. And just so you know, my uh, PBS station, KTCA, they... Uh, ran something be before every Doctor Who story with William Hartnell, and it basically was an apology for about what you're about to see. That's the way that I always took it. Take a look. This is KTCA TV, St. Paul, Minneapolis, Channel 2. It takes two, Channel 2. The following Doctor Who adventure relives the first dramatic moments of Doctor Who on television. William Hartnell stars in the title role. Produced in the 1960s, this Doctor Who episode captures the vision and technology of its time. And now, across more than two decades, we return to the adventures of William Hartnell as Doctor Who. Doctor Who is brought to you locally by the Unpainted Place, designers, builders, and retailers of natural wood furniture. <laughs> So you have that, you get an unearthly child, which, you know, it's, I, I enjoy it much more now than I did back then. And you go through the stories, but when you get to Marco Polo and I'm, I'm, I'm following along with my TV guide, which for those in UK, it's similar to the radio times or TV times, the TV guide listings, we get to edge of destruction. Next story is Marco Polo. It's not there. It's been skipped. So in my mind, I'm like, oh, that must be a missing story, an episode, a missing episode. All seven at the time. And and I started to understand a little bit better because in the, the program guide, it does say next to it, like parentheses, how many episodes per week. So I've started to kind of get it a little bit at that point. But then it started skipping other Hartnells. I'm like, well, that's to be expected because they, they, the PBS people told me that they're missing and then you uh, get to season three, and I, I know I'm saying stuff that you all know. A lot of that's missing. And, you know, you start to be like, well, I really wanted to see the Dalek Master Plan, and now I don't see them. Keep in mind at this point, I don't know that there are orphaned episodes. I just think that if you're skipping it, that means the whole thing is gone, and I would never see any of it. 
anything of it whatsoever. So, you know, we're skipping over all of these stories. Like, I wanted to see Galaxy 4. I wanted to see The Massacre. I wanted to see Celestial Toymaker. I mean, I, did, I had seen some pictures of these um, through DWM and DWB. I'm not, I'm missing all of this, and I'm getting annoyed. But when we get to the War Machines, first of all, I, I'm loving it. Secondly, I'm just like, well, at least now, we're going to see, I know there'll probably be some more missing stories, but I'm going to see all these wonderful programs that I really want to see, like 10th Planet, Power of the Daleks, Evil of the Daleks, Tomb of the Cybermen, all of these wonderful things. Um, the Yeti, I can't wait to see the Yeti. I'm also a huge fan of 60s Cybermen. If you saw my Tomb of the Cybermen video, you could tell. I really love it. And I, those that's, to me, the best design, all of them all of them from the 60s and so stuff like wheel in space the invasion all this stuff i can't wait to see it so i have my program guide i know after the war machines it should be the smugglers i get the tv guide and i'm like you know fumbling okay this week is the war machines next week what are we going to see is it going to be smugglers it's the dominators it's it's the dominators and I, I just, I mean, I just stared at this thing. Like, I understood that we would be missing some Troughton. I'm sure, because there's all those missing episodes. But surely there would have been something between the War Machines and the Dominators. You're missing virtually his entire the Troughton run. I was so devastated. I was so upset by this. I mean, how can you be upset, I guess, but as a kid in particular, and like I said, I did not know orphaned episodes existed. I never thought that I would see anything from those stories. We're going to do a video on that soon enough. But that was really disappointing. It's just a very, very upsetting situation uh, for me. So I was, I was really bummed about that um, because, let's be honest, I wasn't interested in watching The Dominators, and it really... It really bummed me out when the Dominators aired the next week because it, I, I already had a bias against it and nothing against that story. There came a point, too, that realized, because I thought, well, at, at least we're going to see the invasion. And we didn't see that either. And when we get around to the invasion, I'm going to have to go on to a rant for, for PBS, for Lionheart. Why couldn't you have included the invasion in the syndication regardless of only two episodes missing? But that's for another time altogether. Something I was thinking about when I was putting this together and, and knowing how things are so different now than they were back in 1985, for example. In 1985, in the U.S., is when um, the Hartnell package of episodes became available to PBS stations. And that was 17 stories, 17 Hartnell stories that became available. Uh, that, was, that first was released two PBS stations in September of 1985, okay? So that includes also uh, the Time Meddler in full and the War Machines in full. Um, and like I said, uh, my PBS station, KTCA, started running them in 1986. So my question to all my UK uh, uh, viewers out there, for those who have been around long enough, I mean, so the Time Meddler and... The War Machines were in the BBC archive up until that point. Only each story, episode two, existed for each story. And for The War Machines, uh, it was, if I'm not mistaken, a copy of a print from Ian Levine that he got a copy of a print from, from David G. And that was it. And then in early 1985... Uh, full prints of both the Time Meddler and the War Machines were found in Nigeria and returned. So it's pretty incredible, actually, that from the time of it being found, they were included with uh, the package. So it, it made it made the package more robust. We got everything that was complete. And that was pretty cool. At the time, of course, I had no idea. I just assumed that that was part of it. But for my UK viewers, I'm curious what you thought about that. If you heard that at the time, that these were found, but they're they're running like in the US. And I don't try to remember when it would be that you all would have been able to see these because I'm assuming that I don't know if 
BSB ran them. I, I don't know that, but I'm assuming like UK Gold would have, or BBC Two in uh, 19, early 1990s, at least for uh, the Time Meddler. Uh, I'm curious if you, any of you were able to obtain copies from the U.S. broadcasts over at PBS, if you had friends in the U.S. that made copies and sent them back to you, like NTSC copies and sent them back to you. Uh, because I know some of you, if you're like me, you're gonna, if you know it's out there, you're going to want to get it. And this is something that uh, really, you know, nowadays it's kind of unheard of that that would have just been put into the package. Even Tomb of the Cybermen in the U.S., was always, I mean, that wasn't added right away when it was found in 1992. I mean, they started to realize, yeah, that's VHS material, that we can make money off of that. But also, it became part of those pledge drives I talked about, where they would show specific programs or stories only during pledge drives. My understanding, too, was like that, at least for a while, maybe it eventually probably ended up getting into the run. But that's going to be another story for another day about how some of these stories were actually obtained by somebody else to show on PBS. It didn't go through the usual channels of like Lionheart. It's very interesting. And that's the stuff that affects like uh, Planet of the Daleks, Invasion of the Dinosaurs. So we have that to look forward to. But I was just curious if anybody in uh, the UK tried to go out of their way to get copies of this or if they were also running in packages like in Australia or New Zealand so you could get them in PAL, please send me a note. I would be very interested in knowing what if, if any of you got that. Because like I said, if I knew it was out there at the time, like if I knew, I mean, if I know something's out there and I don't have it, yeah, I want to get it, totally. Now, something else I find very interesting too when I did research for this, at, because I'm always interested in the broadcast history, at least in the U.S., um, and make sure my dates, in my mind, match what actually happened, uh, that I went to Broadcast Who, which is an in invaluable resource for broadcast of all the stories all around the world. And uh, I noted that for the War Machines, there was a footnote that was on... Uh, on the story in the syndication in the U.S. And remember, like I said, that became available in the U.S. in 1985. So what you have is this footnote that says, the Hartnell to Troughton regeneration scene was apparently spliced into the end of the war machines for U.S. broadcasts. So basically what they're saying is that they took the regeneration from the 10th planet and spliced it at the end of the war machines so um you can have next week the doctor the second doctor being in the dominators i had never heard that before i had never seen that before i have had you know multiple copies of this story from all over america from recorded off air i never heard that before i've asked people about it they never heard it before so I went to the source, and that's T.J. Lubinsky. And T.J. has a lot of uh, experience with the syndication of Doctor Who. And we're going to talk more about that in future episodes. But he uh, is very much a champion for the De Silva narrations of the Tom Baker episodes. We'll talk about that at some point. But he also basically was the person that always was working with syndication from in some way from the 90s till really not too terribly long ago he might still be for all i know uh but so i decided i'm gonna ask him because he knows what's going on so i asked tj i sent him that quote and i asked him is this true and what he said to me was this not at all i have the master tape it didn't happen we talked about doing a package of orphaned episodes but not enough stations were interested so it didn't happen. And like I said, he actually holds all the master tapes for the NTSC syndicated, North American syndication packages of Doctor Who from uh, Lionheart. He he got, he, he acquired them over time. And, um, and that's a fascinating story of its own, isn't it? That we're going to delve into at some point. But what, um, what I'm going to say to that is I'm going to, I'm going to challenge broadcast who 
to take that down because it's not accurate. If anybody says that that is accurate, send me a recording of it. Send me a recording of that ending to it because I don't think it's real. In fact, I think I know exactly where that came from. And that's something we're going to get to at, you know, in this, in this video, because I did a little, I wasn't even trying to, and I came across what I think is where this came from incorrectly. So one of the things about this video that I think is, always will stand out to me, first of all, the pure excitement of, of knowing that this was coming out and wanting to get a copy of it. Um, it, it came out in June of 1997 and uh, I don't think that the NTSC uh, release came out. It could have possibly came out in October of that year. It might have came out in 1998. I, I just don't remember. Uh, but I probably have mentioned, in fact, I know I mentioned uh, the last uh, one of the last videos talking about the Minnesota Doctor Who Viewing Society that we did. It was kind of the anti-Doctor Who fan club where all we wanted to do was bring people in so that we could do a um, a viewing of Doctor Who episodes, some rarities, some fun stuff. Um, Doctor Who wasn't being run on PBS, at least KTCA at that moment. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to have an outlet for people who wanted to see it to come in and watch Doctor Who. So knowing that it was coming out in June, I think the latter June meeting possibly July, but I think it was still in June, even though this itself came out in June, we decided to schedule the War Machines, this this version of it, which everyone who came, you know, it, sometimes we got 20, 20 some, 30 some people in the room. Sometimes we got not too many. It was always hard in the summer, but we always had a public library and we got a room, a big room, and we projected it on this big screen. It was fantastic. It was so much fun to be able to to share Doctor Who with people this way. And uh, so we, we needed to get a hold of this. And this was before I started collecting the PAL VHSs myself. And um, so I had a friend who would make conversions and we would... Uh, have these, you know, he would send me a tape of a conversion of this. It's a pirated copy. And, uh, but I really wanted to show it. So he just sent me the tape. It got there just in the nick of time. So we, we brought the tape and we set up and started playing it. And like I said, this is pirated copy. Everyone knows it's not available in the U.S. at this point. And the video starts with this. Darling, four weddings. Here, Rocky, four, five, six. Excuse me, I bought this video from you last Saturday, so. Well, I can't understand a word. Plane spotting? Not surprised. Oh, talking to Scott, yeah, ain't they? No, I mean, it's the, hey? it's the sound. Yeah. It's hopeless. It's absolutely yeah. hopeless. Yeah, 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 no trains in it either. I suppose that's my fault as well. Here, darling, four ninety nine. Well, the picture's rubbish as well. Well, that's your tracking, mate. Well, it's all right on my other videos. Ooh, tracking's touchy. Be careful. Most pirate videos are unwatchable, and there's no comeback. Got a receipt, eh? Got a receipt? Look, you said last week. Said it's no good, mate. Oral contract. Not worth the paper it's printed on. Yeah, darling, four weddings. Train spotting. As advertised on Crime Stoppers. Pirate videos, daylight robbery. And we laughed. We thought it was so much fun. We thought we were really funny about that. But that is the case. I mean, I did eventually buy it. Doesn't mean that it was not the right way of doing it. Uh, but it, it just, we really wanted to show the war machines. And I, let's be honest, the Doctor Viewing, Minnesota Doctor Viewing Society, all that stuff kind of came about the same way. I'm not going to lie. But it was fun sharing that with people. Also, what was really cool... I used to do these like little newsletters. It's like uh, eight and a half by eleven, folded in half. Get them copied at Kinko's, lay it out, all for this viewing party. Even though it wasn't a fan club, and we really, I mean, especially the more we started doing, it, I mean, it's more. All the stuff is always for me. It's not for really anyone else. I wanted to have a video room, so I had a video room. People showed up, great. If I'm doing videos on Doctor Who VHS releases and people watch it, great. But so. 
I uh, got in touch with Steve Roberts because at that point he started the Restoration Team website. At that point, he uh, you know started to write articles on this stuff. He didn't. They didn't do the uh, the chat, the forum, which really ended up being the downfall of everything, sadly. But I reached out to him. I like, could I do an interview with you? Like a written, like I'll send the questions. Could you answer them? And he's just like, absolutely. And so he did that, and I put that in that little newsletter. I have still a few of these different newsletters I'd created, you know, brochures, whatever you want to call, but I can't find that one, which is a bit of a bummer. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I feel happy about doing that because I did it at the time that um, a lot of people were still like kind of getting to the belief that Doctor was being treated very well, the episodes, and that I don't think a lot of people had reached out to the restoration team or Steve. So I felt really happy to have that and share that with people. And the thing with that is that it is truly um, the start of a friendship that I've had with Steve for since 1997 and it wasn't it, it certainly didn't hurt that he was also one to go to the Gallifrey conventions and I would see him there and uh see I don't think I've ever saw him at the Chicago convention I think it's always been at the the Gallifrey in, in Los Angeles but got to see him been on panels with him uh we've exchanged a lot of uh notes back and forth over the years in fact there's times that I put out these videos not the Doctor Who ones but others that he, he'll politely correct me on, on stuff that I'm not getting right, you know, because he wants the right information out there. And uh, one of the last times I was in London, he gave me a tour of the BBC archive. You know, it truly, you know, I've been very blessed to have him as a friend through all these years. And I, I, I try not to bother him, to be very honest, because there's, you know, a lot of people, but it's always nice. Like, sometimes he'll reach out. Sometimes if I have a question, I'll reach out to him. And I always enjoy that. And so that's something I always think about when I think about the War Machines, is having a nice uh, friendship with Steve. And, and it grew with friendship with others. It's been, it's been really fun to see how that works. I always like to talk about how this, how, like, this appeared for DWM and DWB. Because it's, it, that was always part of the fun of it, wasn't it? To be able to... Uh, to enjoy the the kind of the excitement running up to it that might still be the case for the blu-rays it was for the dvd to some extent for some reason this really was always the way that it worked for me so um when it came to dwm uh dwm 247 published in january of 1997 that's where they announced the title would be released, uh, but there was no mention of any restoration or any any footage being put back into it at all. So uh, that was, you know, it just was like this is a title coming out, and from there, um, in March, in issue two forty nine, that's where it makes mention of uh, confirmation of the title that it would include uh, footage being returned to the episodes, and then in DWM two fifty two with a review by Dave Owen, um, just kind of going through. But I, there wasn't, I don't believe there was much about the restoration at all. That's where you go into the following, uh, that was in June, for the July issue, which would have been DW, DWM 253. That's where you have a look at the restoration, and which is written by Richard Molesworth. That article is also on the Restoration Team website. And that is where... He mentions in the article that there was a regeneration scene tacked on at the end of War Machines in the U.S. So it would end with, uh, the War Machines would end with the regeneration, and then the following week would be the Dominators, or whatever the following episode, however you want to say it. That's where I think that started, and that is incorrect. And, uh, you know, that's fine. You know, people make mistakes, but, you know, I'm actually surprised to see it in Broadcast Who?, on the site because uh, knowing how good they are with the facts and everything, this is truly uh, not, um, this is truly something that didn't happen. And once again, if they have proof it happened, they should let us know because there's nothing that says that. And it's like 
I'm not getting worked up about it. I know it kind of maybe sounds like it is, but it's just like, it just doesn't even make sense. How, how would that even work at the end of the War Machines? And it just cuts to Hartnell on the floor regenerating. Uh, maybe, not maybe, it didn't happen. <laughs> so for the release itself, first of all, as we talked about, that with this release, um, we are well within the rebranding of Doctor Who. Going back to 1996, the TV movie came out in May of 1996. I, I don't remember the air date of the UK broadcast. I certainly remember it was May 14th in the US. I think we got it first. Um, but in the UK for the VHS range, The Hand of Fear was released. And that was the last release to feature the diamond logo on a VHS cover. And the next release was going to be the TV movie with the reflective... Um, new logo which eventually was going to be called uh once once they got it figured out the blue mirrored logo that's how the bbc calls it uh and then the only other vhs release of that year was the green death which was a tribute to john pertwee who had died in may of of uh, 1996 it was dead the tv movie was dedicated to him uh we go to 1997 and that's where we start getting things a little bit more uh, normalized for the brand. That's where we first get this, uh, this chrome version of the logo. It doesn't have the first couple releases, doesn't have the little um, glow around it. In fact, uh, it, you know, and it really looks off to me. It looks much better with the glow. And those releases were the Leisure Hive and then uh, the, the Awakening and Frontios. For June, we had the War Machines. Now, for Leisure Hive and The Awakening and Frontios, we still had um, art. You know, we still had painted covers. Once we got here, what is this? Whoever said that this is what covers should look like? Um, this is... Uh, <laughs> I don't understand what... Who... I mean, this is Black Sheep. And I, I, I always love to give a lot of uh, support to the artists who made these covers because 90, unfortunately, 80 some percent are brilliant because Black Sheep has taken over. Not all Black Sheep covers are bad, but this one at the start, first of all, it's super easy to make a galaxy and then twirl it in Photoshop um, so that it looks, so you get this crappy effect and once once people learned how to do it it was everywhere and, you know the people making covers you know and they posted on twitter and stuff that started way back in the vhs range folks this is really i was doing it i did it for the 10th my my horrific cover for the 10th planet i still have i still have it i'll share that someday we can all laugh really loud uh but you know where's the post office tower on this thing you know, there's key wonders. I mean, it's just this weird sort of bizarre look. And I, I can just imagine, I don't remember at the time, but I could just imagine everybody being like, what is, what had happened to this stuff? And, you know, Steve, Steve Cole, Steve, I just, I just praised you. What, what was going on? Uh, it's, it, it happens, right? So you got your tape. Um, and then, of course, you have your cover, which this is the first, if I'm not mistaken, the first VHS cover and not the last, where it becomes fold out. And what's nice about this, the fold out on this is talking about the restoration of the war machines. This is, um, this is documented. This restoration was heavily documented. That's what's exciting about this because they absolutely wanted to say this is special and it was it was a truly special release even with the cover looking as like this um it was still obviously i'm so i was so excited for it i mean it almost made me kind of forget how crappy this this cover is because we have it but you know you look at like the dvd cover you look at the book cover you look at all anything else it's really, really good. This one, 
isn't. Thing is, too, with this, you think this is bad? The NTSC cover is horrible, and uh, <clears throat> it's the same basically. But then the logo that they use for the rest of the range, their their blue version of the logo is. I think truly atrocious. I don't understand how you could think that that was good. And I'm going to take that back. I do think that they switched to the proper logo at some point that that mirrors what the BBC is doing. But for a while, they have a logo that is just really bad. Now, I know there's people who don't like this version of the logo, this kind of this chrome version of the logo. I love this. And I, I equate it to the time that all this good merchandise was coming out. I think it's really cool looking, to be very honest. Don't turn off the video. Don't hate me. But I have never been a fan of the diamond logo. Not really. I mean, it's fine. But to me, it's like, perhaps not this one, but certainly the blue mirror logo that was for the rest of the range. You know, if you want to have this stuff taken seriously, I think that's the way to go. And people are still, and I just read it this week, because uh, as we're recording this, all sorts of news is coming out about the Russell era returning to Doctor Who and, and David Tennant returning and all this stuff. And people are like, well, if he's returning, we gotta, we should return this. And they're showing the diamond logo and stuff. Why do you all like the diamond logo so much? I never understood that. What What is it that even, okay, if you liked it, why don't you move on except that it's not coming back? You know, I get that for a while it was iconic, but it's it's I think it's more dated than anything. I think it's more dated than the neon logo, to be honest. But you all seem to love it, and I don't understand why. I'm glad you do, and I'm sure I'll get hate mail about it, but boy, I just don't understand what it is about that logo you all love. And I'm glad it's not on anything anymore, to be very honest. I can just imagine my viewership has gone down to zero now. I know I'm in the minority on that one. I also think I also think that they really mucked up the back of the of the of the VHS releases as well. I mean these they're just not it's just not dynamic anymore. And it's just a shame. Uh but there's but what's the other good side of it is, as as you will see as we move forward to some of these later releases, like with the fold, you know, gatefold, that it you get a lot of information on these releases. I mean, this alone is really pretty cool that we get a just a, you know some information about about what we're going to be watching. You know, obviously this is before the time of DVDs where you cram everything into it, and I'm so blessed that we do. But this is very uh, this was this what makes it special. This makes it very special. And at this point, we have, you know, a lot of really nice art that, you know, even just how we're advertising about it and stuff. I just think it, it really is, uh, it really was a cohesive brand. And some of it I don't like, and that's fine, but a lot of it I really did. And I think that that is what really made it special and even like the fonts you know like we all try to find fonts like you know that you know as best as we can that matches like we even they at this point had problems with getting a, a correct r on the, the war machines because over time they changed the font a little bit so it's a, a more defined R, you know, just small things like that which make it really fun and this was still using the old bbc logo uh, on the spine you know, uh, so a lot of interesting, a lot of interesting things with with how this looks and stuff. And, uh, you know, speaking of extras, VHS have extras. This one certainly did. You know, I I even forgot about this when I rewatched it, that I knew you know, I actually did kind of forget that there was the blue Peter clip from 1965 uh, that has Valerie uh, Singleton in it. And uh it you know it was the first look at the war machines uh in general ever and they were in the studio and it was a really really fun piece i kind of forgot that that was on the vhs because i had already transferred this a long time ago to digital so i didn't grab the tape to look uh and then after that you have a bbc a bit of bbc continuity from the 
time of uh, broadcast, you know, not from the War Machine's broadcast, but from that era, from that time period, which once again, just a little bit that adds so much extra fun. Once again, this is being put together by people who love Doctor Who as much as I do. That was exciting. That was fun. It's so much, it's so funny. I don't know about all of you, but I look at it like, boy, do we really have it good? Boy, this was, this is like really amazing. You know, I even thought that when we had the interview with Morris Berry on Tomb of the Cybermen, like, that's really neat. Never in a million years would I have thought about what uh, sort of releases we would have when the DVDs came out. And the fact that there are, you know, multiple documentaries on the release for the War Machines DVD. You know, just stuff like that, or more Blue Peter, more archive stuff. Never would have thought that. And that's, what's, that's what I love about this and being able to still appreciate this that this this is not archaic this was fun this was really cool to have like this so i want to talk about the restoration i'm going to do the best i can on this and i want to talk about some of the cuts that were made and i went to the restoration articles for these that were written by steve roberts um and so some of the stuff I'm going to just go through as what, what he called out as cuts and whatnot. But first of all, uh, you know, when I watched The War Machines in 1986, I didn't look and be like, oh, my God, there's a lot cut out of this. I have no idea. You know, I had no idea any of that. Uh, and in what was it, 1996, that uh, Damien had found all those Australian censor clips for Doctor Who, a ton of them. It's always been ironic to me that the stuff that has been cut off because they don't want people to see, in some cases, is the only thing that exists of episodes, certain episodes. Obviously, with the War Machines, the story exists, but there's cuts to them. And these censor clips restores a number of those cuts. So, you know, this is the first time where you can take multiple areas of of source material and create a finished product as close as possible to how it was broadcast. So let alone you have those four episodes that were found in Nigeria, you have the film print from episode two from Ian Levine that um, is not as good quality. Um, they might have gone, eventually they might have gone back to David for to get a transfer of his uh, his uh, film print of it, but I think there was also projector damage as well to that print. But then you have the Australian sensor clips. You also have um, some really good quality clips that were taken from Blue Peter that they that were from the episodes, or even I think extended film clips that were from, that Blue Peter had. And then you had Graham Strong's audio because we all know Graham Strong who is the audio recordist that recorded um, Doctor Who audio and in most cases uh, in a very beautiful you know direct line format but you know we think about that a lot with the missing episodes because we got those beautiful releases but also he didn't know what was going to be missing you know all that time it all existed so he recorded pretty much everything with the exception of stuff like Celestial Toymaker. Um, so War Machines was captured by him. So you have uncut audio recorded at the time broadcast that was also used to help. And I think Paul Vanessis and Richard Molesworth sat and they, they were able to figure out exactly what was missing and be able to uh, come up with a list and see from that point, they see what they can do, what they have, and what they can do to uh, make this as complete as possible. What I'm going to do for episodes three and four, I want to read through the um, the cuts that were made. So if you don't know, this is what was cut, and this is what they did to uh, fix it. And so we're gonna I'm going to share some of that with you right now. I, 
I mean, it just, I mean, at that time, and still does for me, it just blows my mind, all the work that went into this VHS release. It just absolutely blows my mind. And I'm, I, I just, when I watch it, when I watch it now, I can see the cover-ups. Back then, not so much. I just enjoyed it. I knew a lot of work was done with it, but I just enjoyed it. And I really thought that that was really pretty cool how they did that. Now, uh, just also, at this point in the history of restoring Doctor Who, Vidfire was not created yet. I don't know if they had been working on it by this point. I want to say that that wasn't until at least the early 2000s or 1999 for that matter, but I know that it didn't see a release in any Doctor Who VHSs until Planet of Giants. But, uh, so there was no vid fire to this, just the film prints, but a lot of work had been done on it. And, you know, you look at those restoration articles talking about those tape-to-tape -tape transfers. They talk about the work that they have done. You know, it's a workflow that does not exist anymore. What I also find very interesting is to talk about assembling the master duplication tape where it, you know, where they put the BBC ident and stuff like that in front of it. Also, they made sure, Steve made sure to note that they got special permission to get out those Nigerian film prints to uh, do any sort of cleanup work on them, like to, to wet gate them and stuff like that. Kind of like in one of my last videos talking about Terra the Autons, talking about the wet, wet gate process for that. And, you know, I think it's, it's important noting because I think now they have access to anything they want in the BBC archive and then they re return a you know a restored version a restored copy to the the archive for them to hold at that at this point this was all incredibly new so they weren't doing any of that and that you know it shows that they were really doing something that hadn't been done on Doctor Who VHS releases before hell probably wasn't been done in any sort of home media for any of the BBC properties and uh, that was, uh, you know, reading this stuff was just so exciting to me because it's just like the, the handling of broadcast materials and that some stuff they don't generally let out, but they did for them and all the work that went into it and taking this jigsaw and, and creating a finished product of it. That stuff is so fascinating to me. Just like when I was talking about the Monty Python Flying Circus set from Network. That's another gigantic jigsaw puzzle. That dedication is means so much to me because I love watching these programs and I love watching this stuff looking as good as possible. And I'm not going to do a comparison between the cuts between the VHS and the DVD because uh, life is too short, quite frankly. But, you know, just know that I think what ended up happening, first of all, is Vid fired. They they started a ground up restoration on that for that that title, but also I think that they were able to patch things a lot differently than they did for the VHS. So once again, I I think that I I can't say that it's completely complete, but it's pretty darn good. And if it is complete, you know, my apologies for getting that wrong. Wouldn't be the first time. So obviously, you know, what do I think of this release? It's brilliant. I mean, I, I don't even need to say it, do I? I mean, I, I, I'd love to know what you all think of this. Uh, you know, the only thing that starts letting the releases down at this point, which is really frustrating, are the duplication of these stories. Uh, you know, as far as the duplication houses they're using, the type of tapes they're using, you know, especially when you get to the final releases, which the final release was the Reign of Terror box set, but even before that, like Invasion of the Dinosaurs, you know, it's just a really crappy videotape. These, you know, this is okay. When you get to something like the Ice Warriors, that's really suspect, unfortunately, considering all the work that goes into these. Um, but just, I love them. I remember when I watched these again before I made this video, I just was smiling ear to ear because that brings back so many memories and it's so beautiful to see these and i love the fact that i can watch this or i could watch the dvd which is also equally brilliant with this wonderful beautiful cover by clayton hickman and the thing about this it's like 
this is a nighttime shot. You know, this whole thing is nighttime. So, you know, it's just a different take on the cover, but yet still utilizing all of the, um, all of these wonderful things that I had, all these assets and all these iconic shots that I'd love to see on it. What I want to do is I want to show uh, a little bit of the difference in quality between the off-air war machines, the VHS, and the DVD. Let's see how far we've come. Take a look. Good morning, Sir Charles. Doctor. Good morning. I'm sorry morning. I'm late. Late? Late what for? Well, for work. If you'll just show me where your secretary does work, I'll take over. <laughs> I'm afraid I don't quite understand. But Major Green told me to come straight round here at once, as Professor Brett didn't want me this morning, and your secretary was ill. Well, my secretary is away today, but how on earth Brett knew? Still, I mean, if you're here, I'd be very grateful for your help. The office is through there. I'll be there in a moment. All right, thank you very much. How's the video this morning, Doctor? What I'm also wanting to do, which I haven't done before, I want to share an audio comparison between the off-air that Graham had. You can hear the untreated off-air before Mark had a chance to do anything with it, the Randolph tape of the War Machines, as well as the uh, restored audio that was released on the audio CD. Take a listen. It's amazing what had been done. Ah, oh, Minister, if you don't mind, I think I'll ask this fellow a few uh, questions. Uh, uh, just a moment, uh, please. Major Green? Do you know him, Doctor? Yes, of course. Do you remember me, Major Green? Hmm? No, I... I, I don't. I, I'm afraid I don't remember anything. Where am I? What is this place? You don't remember anything. No. You remember this machine? Good heavens, what on earth is this thing? Ah, Minister, if you don't mind, I think I'll ask this fellow a few uh, questions. Uh, uh, just a moment, sir, please. Major Green? Do you know him, Doctor? Yes, of course. Do you remember me, Major Green? Hmm? No, I... I, I don't. I, I'm afraid I don't remember anything. Where am I? What is this place? You don't remember anything. No. You remember this machine? Good heavens, what on earth is this thing? Ah, Minister, if you don't mind, I think I'll ask this fellow a few uh, questions. Uh, uh, just a moment, sir, please. Major Green? Do you know him, Doctor? Yes, of course. Do you remember me, Major Green? Hmm? No, I... I, I don't. I, I'm afraid I don't remember anything. Where am I? What is this place? You don't remember anything. No. Do you remember this machine? Good heavens, what on earth is this thing? I'm really excited to be able to share my memories of this wonderful story. Share your memories with me. Let me know what it was like to get this. Also, UK folks, let me know about whether or not you... Um, had gotten a copy of the War Machines in 1985 when uh, through those tape trading circuits. Also, um, you know, just send me a note. Let me know what you think of these. Are, are these still working for you? Still enjoying these? I feel like sometimes they're getting longer and longer all the time, but these are also because I love talking. I could just end the sentence there. I love talking about Doctor Who. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, send me a note. Do whatever you want to do. Also, Please take a look at my Patreon. Uh, feel free to uh, take part. Otherwise, you know, as I always say, we have a lot more of these to go through, and I hope you're enjoying these, and please reach out. And there are more space adventures on these BBC videos with William Hartnell.